Thank you, everyone. Asking an artist to talk about their work is a bit paradoxical or contradictory. I'll do my best, but I will rely heavily on the images. This projector up on the ceiling is very good, but the images will look best with the room completely dark. Since my work is so deeply informed by where I come from, I'll start there. The arrow is pointing to a little island called Borinquen, at least until a certain European arrived in 1493. Today it's known as Puerto Rico. I was born in the city of San Juan, but grew up in the countryside. As a child, I was surrounded by and exposed to spectacular natural beauty, delicious tropical fruits, and also a rich spectrum of cultural traditions. After high school, I moved to Philadelphia to attend art school and ended up doing an MFA in this building just down the road from Trinity in New Haven. That building was even more brutal than our own brutalist building here on <laughs> campus. Looking back, the culture shock I experienced as I adapted to life outside of Puerto Rico was somewhat traumatic, especially the first few years. I moved to New York City to be a painter, but Puerto Rico remained with me and remains with me today. The two photographs are, have at least 20, maybe 30 years between them. The one on the left is from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and the one on the right is from Hartford. That mural is still there. It's just a few blocks down the street from Trinity. Puerto Rico was not just a nostalgic memory. My upbringing included an awareness of history and especially of the events associated with two specific dates, 1493 and 1898, the two dates Puerto Rican children learn. In 1493, a uh, certain European, Christopher Columbus, arrived. And for the next 400 years nearly, uh, Puerto Rico was ruled by Spain. In 1898, the US invaded. And today, Puerto Rico is considered a possession of the United States. According to the US Supreme Court, it is a possession of the United States, but not a part of the United States. Colonialism isn't just a historical concept when you live it or witness it. I experienced as a child a heavily militarized post-war Puerto Rico swarming with US soldiers and sailors, military convoys taking over roads and heritage sites appropriated and converted to golf courses for the exclusive use of commissioned officers and their families. I became aware of a huge income disparity with most people living day to day while wealthy elites held lavish parties at hilltop mansions. I observed the servile manner it was necessary to adopt in order to get a job in the booming tourism industry. Even as a very young person, I came to understand this problem was insidious and structural. That realization informs everything I do as an artist. I will skip over my time in New York City, except to mention that I quickly became engaged with photography, uh, and I set the paints aside for the moment. Arriving in Trinity College in Connecticut, I very soon met somebody called Professor Milla Reggio. And uh, Milla became acquainted with my work. She came to my studio, looked at my photographs, and felt very strongly that I needed to visit a place called Trinidad. Trinidad is the larger of two islands comprising the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And in 1997, I made my first trip there, thanks to Mila. Uh, in Trinidad, I felt at home immediately because of the many similarities to Puerto Rico. Yet at the same time, it seemed like a foreign place. The colonial architecture is very different. And unlike Puerto Rico, Trinidad has vast natural resources, such as oil and natural gas. So its economy is not dependent on tourism. 
Um, what you see in the photograph in the background are um, towers from the power gen power plant, which have since been dismantled or in the process of being taken down, um, which is another aspect of photography that we won't get into, but the idea of documenting what will be lost or what gets lost at a later time. I never expected to find India so much alive in the Caribbean. Trinidad, like Puerto Rico, had been a Spanish colony, but Sir Ralph Abercrombie took it from Spain for Great Britain. After emancipation, there was a shortage of labor in the sugarcane fields since the formerly enslaved population of African descent had little desire to continue with that excruciating work. This resulted in the importation of Indian indentured workers from the South Indian British colony to the smaller Caribbean colony. But unlike Puerto Rico, Trinidad gained its independence in 1962. While Puerto Rico, while Puerto Ricans are enormously proud of their homeland, within hours of my arrival in Trinidad, I sensed a different pulse, a different vibe. This was confirmed a few days later when a water vendor on the streets of Port of Spain proudly proclaimed, this is our country, after learning I was from Puerto Rico, which he understood to be still a colony under foreign rule. Very quickly, I realized that Trinidad was a place I needed to know and study with my camera. I decided to use black and white film in part because I felt it would let me see more deeply without the distractions of color, and in part as a conscious rejection of the tired, stereotypical depictions of the Caribbean um, as a so-called riot of color or tropical paradise consisting exclusively of sun, sea, and sand. I forgot I was performing. The Caribbean is necessarily a place of innovation. I became fascinated with the nation-building process of the young republic, including the role that arts and diverse religious traditions played in that process. Colonial authorities had banned the skin drum in 1884 because they were afraid of its power. Of course, the drum was central to the culture of the formerly enslaved Africans and indentured Indians that comprised the majority of the population. In that context, and given the availability of empty oil drums discarded by U.S. military bases in Trinidad and even by gas stations and garages, resourceful Trinidadians invented the only new and unique acoustic musical instrument of the 20th century. As far as the steel pan goes, the rest is history. This is a smoke ceremony held by the first peoples of Trinidad. The man on the left with the rattle is Ricardo Barnath Hernandez, who was the president of the Santa Rosa First People's Community in Arima. All members of the community are invited to participate. It's a baptism ceremony, the spiritual Shouter Baptist Church in Barataria. And after several hours of very intense uh, ceremony, we all packed up and drove to Carnage, where the baptism took place at dusk. The final day of Jose in Cedro, South Trinidad. Jose is a religious commemoration of Islamic origin. Note the offshore oil drilling platforms on the horizon. I'd like to point out also that Milarijo was with me when I took all these pictures. And facilitated many of the pictures, or basically all the pictures. Carnival may be a bacchanal of jumping up, whining, and partying all night, but I also learned that Carnival is a serious, cathartic business linked, at a profound w linked in a profound way to liberation and emancipation. The Dame Lorraine is a carnival character that mocks the madame of the plantation, usually the wife of the plantation owner. It became increasingly clear to me that the project had to be a book. Um, Mila and I brainstormed many hours how best to do that. And as part of that process, we were lucky enough to visit Derek Walcott in New York City, his apartment. And he loved the photographs and gave us permission to use any quote of his that we liked in the book. And also, um, out of discussion of what the title of this book should be, he said we were all involved with complicated long titles. And he said, why don't you just call it 
in Trinidad. <laughs> and so we did, and it was a wonderful process putting the book together. It's a, it's a rather unusual book because it combines duotone color, duotone black and white reproduction with full color pages. Um, and that book and the, pro the project led to a few other things. We did an exhibit here at Trinity called Making in Trinidad, um, The Anatomy of a Book, which looked at how it is that art books are put together, photography books are put together. Um, I worked with our curator, Felice Caivano, and it was a wonderful exhibit. You can see some pictures on the left here. It included all the preliminary work and whatnot. Um, the Lens blog at the New York Times picked up the work and published it. Um, and uh, I'd like to quote a couple of the comments which I found very interesting. To me, uh, the comments uh, signaled that the choice to use black and white photography was the correct choice. Um, so the first, the first uh, quote from the comments is, black and white photography can be very effective, but here it totally misses the point. <laughs> <coughs> the colors of Carnival is its essence. These look like poorly done black and white uh, point-and-shoot pictures from a photographer who was bored with the subject and simply looking for a different, to be simply looking to be different from for no real reason. Fortunately, most of the comments read like the next one. Some good points about the use of black and white. Color is often a crutch for a poorly composed image. I can't really uh, move on to my next project that I want to tell you about without acknowledging a wonderful friend uh, who I had the opportunity to meet and who, from whom I gained enormous amount of insight from the beginning. I met Tony in 1997 when he was here at Trinity. He was very much a part of our program in Trinidad and he remains with me even though he sadly passed away last year. Um, it's it's uh, an unfathomable loss for those of us who knew him. The Trinidad project required a lot of travel. Just to get my camera out and start taking pictures meant spending an entire day on an airplane, switching off in Miami, arriving late at night, and then also giving up another day on the way back. And there was obviously cost involved with that. But artists are restless. We need to be doing stuff. We need to be making stuff. And so really since I moved to Hartford, uh, I had been eyeing the city with a great interest. Um, so uh, as a combination of kind of restlessness, need to be doing, I just, without thinking much about it, began to document the city. My decision to photograph Hartford in the end in color was as deliberate as my decision to photograph Trinidad in black and white. In other words, the narrative drove the decision. I wanted to challenge the preconceived ideas and challenge, uh, and challenge uh, stereotypes I heard about the city since my first arrival here. In this case, using color was the best way to do that. Incidentally, this is also my first project using digital photography. Um, colonial New England, grab, drab, gray, and then this, uh, to use the cliche from Trinidad, explosion of color, riot of color. But I looked at industrial Hartford, what little bit of less, what little bit is left of it. Um, the insurance industry, um, and I became to, I started noticing uh, a, cer a certain vocabulary and a certain syntax of how the city was held together uh, and how cities are held together. For example, the stories that can be told by posts, <laughs> simple posts, um, <coughs> three generations of posts by, done by the Institute of Living, or a post announcing in a kind of poetic way, ice and oil. Although I photographed the built environment, I saw the city's structures as a manifestation of a population in flux, of new arrivals, of contrasts, and clashes of old and new, a Muslim city, a Caribbean city, in old Puritan New England. And color became, in a way, a metaphor for the evolving city. I also saw a multi-layered city with each new population applying a new layer of history, a new layer of color, uh, or literally a new layer of paint or pattern. I 
I was forced to develop a new vocabulary or syntax for seeing the city, processing the history of urban photography, and also finding my way, my own way to depict this city. Uh, 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 obstacles became necessary elements in the photographs. So uh, I found, for example, that automobiles were in the way of what I wanted to photograph <laughs> all the time. But hey, that's that's the city. You, you're gonna, you're, there's gonna be cars, and so. Um, I turned them into reflecting pools, and that became something I became very heightened, uh, 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 heightened awareness of and attempted to use over and over uh, in the images, because it's everywhere. Um, I wanted to share this work with the city, and was lucky enough to be able to do two exhibits, one at the Connecticut Historical Society, uh, one at the, uh, the Art Walk Gallery at the Hartford Public Library downtown. Um, as part of this exhibit, um, I worked with uh, a wonderful designer named Rich Holland um, to produce an exhi exhibition catalog which we deliberately printed on newsprint uh, so, that they could, so that it could be given out free. And we printed thousands of these. We have plenty left if anybody wants one. Um, the the, the uh, publication could also be arranged as you see fit so that it wasn't bound, there was no staples, there was no binding, you could rearrange the pages. Um, that led to a more formal publication, which is the one Sonia mentioned in her introduction, uh, a book of photographs, Hartford Scene. Um, traveling to Puerto Rico at least once a year Puerto Rico was always with me and informing everything I do, yet Puerto Rico is not any more free today than when I was a little baby shaking my rattle. To be free means you'd be proud of yourself. To be proud of yourself means to be creative. To be creative means to defend your dream. To defend your dream means to have the courage to make your dream come true in your lifetime. And once your dreams come true, you will never have to worry about dying as long as you live. <laughs> I was thinking a lot about Pedro Pietri for all these years. Um, he was in Trinity in 1998, extraordinary visit. Um, and um, in the last decade, Puerto Rico actually became less and less free, not more free became more colonized, just as other places in the world shed their colonial yokes. One example is the odious debt, or the illegitimate debt, that Puerto Rico found itself uh, having to contend with. At one point, the governor of Puerto Rico declared that the debt was actually unpayable. In, 19, in 2016, President Obama signed uh, a law into uh, uh, creating something called a promesa Fiscal Oversight Board, which basically stripped all semblance of democracy from Puerto Rico. Um, all decisions having anything to do with any kind of budgetary or spending had to be run, had to be approved, had to be created by this Fiscal Oversight Board. So uh, the so-called elected government, the so-called elected government, played second fiddle to this imposed Fiscal Oversight Board. On top of that, we had Hurricane Maria, Donald Trump shows up with his paper towels, and all of this is stewing in me, and I felt an inescapable need to finally address directly the colonial situation of Puerto Rico in my work. The question was, how do I go about that? I reached back into my paint box of memories and lived experience, which included um, consuming, as a child, a sweet, an artificially flavored soda called Old Colony, which was originally imported from the US and ironically is still made and sold in Puerto Rico to this day. Another one of my childhood memories is visiting this place, the Museum of Natural History in, in Muñoz Rivera Park in San Juan. I was struck by the reverence by which visitors regarded anything inside these glass cases, desiccated corpses of animals, anything inside a glass case or on a pedestal was, seemed, to, seemed to be imbued with a certain power. 
As an older child, I was taken to the Museum of Natural History in New York City. I was also exposed to books and images about Puerto Rico in the early years of the U.S. occupation. These memories suggested to me the complicity of museums and of media in the process of othering and reinforcing white supremacy. I understood that museums hold power and that every decision made about how museums are configured is informed by systems of power and class and politics. And of course, my time in Trinidad was instrumental in helping me conceive the new project. Appropriation to take ownership over the very tools that were used to oppress us in order to expose them and turn them back against the oppressor by recontextualizing them. What did I appropriate? The archive. The colonizer's gaze. I wanted to work with deliberate appropriate with with a de deliberately work with a, um, sub with um, hurtful stereotypes and subvert them and turn them back on themselves. I wanted to expose the relentless need to racialize every pictorial depiction of Puerto Rico. The caption is enlarged because I didn't think you'd be able to read the small text, but that's the actual caption of the photograph, printed in a book in 1898, which was sold in the mainland United States as a, as a means to, believe it or not, popularize the idea that the U.S. should have colonies and should have an empire. Another uh, sort of grouping of materials that I appropriated were magazine articles and certain tropes and beliefs that were perpetrated. For example, the belief that Puerto Rico was an unsolvable problem to the United States. This is, this is a, a phrase that's repeated even today. I also wanted to appropriate objects that would resonate in interesting ways and offer a counterpoint to the images. So, you have the image with its caption, presented in contrast to a reproduction of a Greek, of a Roman copy of a Greek statue of Adania. And there are subtexts and hidden narratives that we could explore much further if we had more time. But if you understand a little bit about the mythology, then you can see the connection between the depiction of the laundress, right, and the daniad from Greek mythology. The futility of a repetitive task that can never be completed. I also appropriated historical archival footage, video, film, and I decided to put the gold frames not on the artwork, but on the wall labels. Um, and I decided to put up the images with pushpins, which museums don't use. But I decided to use gold pushpins. <laughs> and like any good archive, I had to have a stamp so that everything has the official Museum of the Old Colony stamp, just like they use in the British Museum and such places. Uh, I learned early that people were having a hard time believing that these archival materials were actually real. They, the people would say, yo, you made that up, or you photoshopped it, or you documented. As a result, every iteration of the project comes with a checklist which gives the sources of, every, of everything in the, in, the, in the installation. Like all museums, I had to have a website that ended in org. <laughs> You're free to go there. It's an actual website. It's not just a, a mock-up. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of process, I worked in miniature because a lot of the, as it turned out, I ended up using, doing these installations in quite large galleries and um, the only way I could 
conceptualize it was to make a, a scale model. So if you look on the bottom, you can see on the left my little, my little mock-up with tape and tiny little pictures. And on the right is what it actually looked like in the gallery. Um, so the scale is actually one inch to one foot. So the, the pictures, uh, the four pictures on the outside, actually in the bottom and on the right, there's, on the left, they're three inches, and on the right, they're three feet. The picture in the middle, the image in the middle is bigger than three feet. Um, venues. Well, we intended to take over the site on Fifth Avenue in New York City, but that wasn't quite happened yet. Um, but we have done the installation in a number of museums. Um, it started in a wonderful place, again, through a connection with Trinity, when we, uh, inaugurated the, Trini the Trinity House in Port of Spain. Um, as part of a, a conference that was made, uh, as part of that, we, um, I, I uh, presented the first version of the Museum of the Old Colony in a place called Alice Yard, which is an experimental art space in Port of Spain. And uh, they have a tiny little box gallery, which you're seeing here. Uh, the images were printed on, um, on 11 by 17 copier paper. They're done on a, photo on a photocopier deliberately because I wanted to do away with any sense that this was something collectible or valuable. I wanted the power to come from the images, not from the idea that it was a vintage or a valuable or a piece of art of any sort. Um, I'm skipping, I'm not showing you images from every venue, uh, but it was very, very important and significant to me that the show, that the, that the installation uh, was, was, um, was uh, was on view at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Juan. The Museum of Contemporary Art in San Juan is a fantastic museum. It's very much artist driven. And um, this, this uh, version of the exhibit went up right after Hurricane Maria. In fact, it was very difficult to get the work there. Uh, normally, I would fly myself and install the show. That wasn't possible. So I sent the images uh, rolled up in cardboard tubes um, through express mail, which is supposed to take two days. It took two weeks, but it got there. Um, and um, I did eventually get there to see it, and we did some forums and some talks there. Very, very powerful for me to have that opportunity to see it and to, to, uh, to speak with the director of the museum there and establish this uh, as the permanent home for the project. So while the project is ongoing, and um, we will continue and do it in different venues. The spiritual home, so to speak, of the project is at uh, El Museo de Arte Contemporáneo in San Juan, where there are also educational programs. And of course, as you can imagine, wonderful things happen at this venue. For example, some of these senior citizens recognize people in the photographs, right? Things like that, or family members. Very, very um, emotional. Um, another venue, um, after this was uh, up at Hampshire College. And a wonderful thing happened at Hampshire College, which was, well, many wonderful things happened at this venue, but one was that the um, exhibit was seen by uh, a curator and scholar who I admired for many years, Maurice Berger. Uh, Maurice was the author of um, a number of books, and he was relentless about calling out the hypocrisy and racism in the art world. He became very famous and very notorious for doing that. Um, and all of, out of the blue, I get an email from him that he had gone to see the show, he had loved it, and he invited me to, uh, to produce the show at the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture at uh, UMBC in Baltimore. That ended up being the largest venue so far. And as the, um, as the exhibit went forward, uh, it grew. And I incorporated more and more objects, more images, more videos. So this is what you're seeing is the uh, actually the, 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 well, not the last, but the, the last biggest version of the show. Maurice Berger wrote the introductory text. And I continued to um, develop this idea of tableaus, using objects in a museum-like way within their vitrines. Um, this piece is called the Museum Desk, which is the imaginary desk at which the imaginary director of the museum sits, um, covered with the imaginary objects that are very real, right, that he would have. Um,
the um, the um, the exhibit as it's more or less as it's conceived at this point works with groupings of images. So there are groupings of images that relate to groupings of objects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. Uh, early U.S. Um, uh, uh, occupation forces uh, were relentless in racializing every aspect of Puerto Rican life and every depiction, every, every photograph always mentions the race of the people, the color of their skin, which ones are lighter, which ones are darker. And then, so, so uh, uh, not, I was not surprised to discover this souvenir from Puerto Rico from the 1950s, which is identical to souvenir that might have been sold in the southern United States, but it does say Puerto Rico on it. It was sold in Puerto Rico as a souvenir. Um, the, the scope of the exhibit ranges from 1898, the invasion of the U.S. forces up until modern times. Believe it or not, yes, there is a Puerto Rico monopoly game, and all the banks that are involved in the debt are pictured in the monopoly game. Uh, it's, it's quite, um, quite bizarre. So this is just a few panoramas of the, of the exhibit. Maurice was particularly a scholar of race, and so uh, working with him, we developed this little grouping having to do with whiteness, the concept of whiteness in Puerto Rico. Again, all the images were from books from the 1910s, 1920s. The installation operates on various levels. If you know the history, it will speak to you in one way. If you don't, it's, it, it will still speak to you, but perhaps in other ways. For example, who, who knows who the woman is here in this picture? Few people will know, few people will not know. Um, uh, the woman is, her name is Lolita Lebron. And she was, um, uh, obviously, if you look at this, you can, you can gather the defiant gaze. You can, you can perceive some things about who she might be. But if you know who she was, then the meaning the exhibit takes on another, another uh, uh, this, this grouping of images takes on another meaning. Um, actually, when she was released from prison uh, in, 19, in 1979, the Washington Post magazine had this picture on the cover with the caption, Terror Wore Lipstick. She was uh, one of the, she was the leader of a group who, um, who entered the US Congress in 1954 and shot bullets and shot some of the congressmen, uh, and they were trying to call attention to the struggle for Puerto Rican independence. Most of them were uh, jailed for many, many years. Jimmy Carter pardoned them in 79. And so she plays a very interesting role in the history of 20th century Puerto Rico, which Puerto Ricans will know when they see this, but others will just have to respond to the visual input from the slide. Um, there are many sort of sub-themes that run throughout the exhibit. Um, the role of women in 20th century. Some of you may know many women were forcibly sterilized. Puerto Rican women were used as guinea pigs for the birth control pill. Uh, and uh, uh, in this venue, there were two uh, video pieces that I did. One uh, was in a screening room in the back of the gallery, which was in a discreet room, which you could enter, and this projection would be filling the whole room. The other one was on this monitor, and you observed it sort of as you were getting towards the end Once of the Once a Spanish exhibit. colony, Puerto Rico is now a U.S. territory. Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. English is widely spoken. The U.S. dollar is the official currency, and no passport is required. This is an island surrounded by water, big water, ocean water. Puerto Rico is kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card. Becoming a state just means a bigger welfare state. It means a greater incentive not to work. Don't speak ill of Puerto Rican statehood. So if the topic comes up, just say you support statehood or change the subject. The appeal of being a state is that so many people don't work. In New York, we, we may be the janitors and we may be the maids. In Puerto Rico, the doctors and lawyers are Puerto Rican. You'll see a strong country, people who work hard, uh, to make sure you have a good time. Que tengan todos muy buenas noches y felicidades a nuestra nueva reina, Miss U.S. Puerto Rico 2019, Madison Anderson. Today I want to talk with you about the crisis in Puerto Rico. All of the murders that are going on in Puerto Rico are 99% drug related. It's either people that owe other drug lords money or there's a bad deal that went wrong, but it's not tourists. 
It's not people that live here. It's not the gringos. But the difference is this is an island sitting in the middle of an ocean. And it's a big ocean. It's a very big ocean. From the bottom of my heart, please help us. Because we're dying here. It's a war zone. They need help here. And we weren't treated fairly by the media because we really did a good job. Have you seen any sign of supplies coming None, this way? None. Zero. Medicine? Nothing. I mean, one example. They had these beautiful soft towels, very good towels. Why is it that we hear so much from the liberal media that President Trump's racist, he didn't want to help Puerto Ricans because they're brown? Like, we've actually heard that narrative, which is just astounding because we know that's not true. Uh, yeah, it's completely false. Now, I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack. I would love to see Puerto Rico succeed as a mecca of free market capitalism. Right now, it, you know, it's a poster child for the failures of socialism. People of Puerto Rico need to know that they're not forgotten, that they're part of the American family, uh, and uh, Congress's responsiveness to this issue, even though this is not a perfect bill, uh, at least moves us in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Everybody speaks English. I mean, nobody addresses me. Once I get out of, you know, the, the, the gates of the Ritz, you know, Ritz Carlton, you know, I go out into, you know, into a movie theater. They're, you know, they're speaking Spanish. In resorts, you shouldn't have a problem. But when you're visiting the cities and towns, you're likely to run across a lot of people who don't speak English. You know, I've been there 17 years doing business there, and I don't speak two words of Spanish. We are also praying for the people of Puerto Rico. We love Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. And we also love Puerto Rico. Que progreso está buscando todos ustedes. Que progreso. Esta lucha que ustedes están lanzando la para bienestar a todo este pueblo. Somos uno. luchar por sacar a la gente corrupta que está en este gobierno, que no merece estar aquí, que no tiene la capacidad, ni la inteligencia, ni nada para estar en, dirigiendo este país en estos momentos. Muchas gracias. The video is uh, towards the end of the exhibit, as is what you see here on the, on the left, which is an, an installation piece called An Orgy of Color, which is another one of the stereotypical phrases that was used to describe the marketplaces and the people in general. Um, so this is a piece that actually has two parts. You can see on the left, uh, beach chairs, towels, all the things that would be normally associated with life by the pool and whatnot, except they're all in black. They're all completely devoid of color. Uh, but on the other side of the gallery uh, is uh, a wall of tourist postcards um, in living color. So the exhibit was extraordinary experience. A lot of people came. We did some great talks. Um, uh, and shortly after it closed, this happened. So it was uh, another blow. Um, however, the project goes on. Maurice had, was very committed to touring this exhibit and keeping it going, which is what we're doing. Um, I was very happy to have been invited to uh, participate in a festival in New York City called Photoville, where uh, it's the largest outdoor photography festival in the world. This happened during the pandemic, and I had to somehow figure out a way to condense that entire uh, installation of almost 4,000 square feet and about 100 and some photographs to a banner, a vinyl banner that could be printed outdoors. Uh, but we did it, you know, and it, it was put up here in, uh, under the Brooklyn Bridge. It's currently hanging in Colts Park in Hartford, if anybody wants to head down there. Um, and the project goes on. It goes on in Photoville, and um, next, uh, next year, early next year, um, we'll be installing it at James Madison University, an even bigger venue with more stuff, more objects, and a bigger book. So far, there have been two exhibition catalogs. Uh, the, the one that's planned for uh, JMU will be 100 pages and be a great, hopefully, a great little book. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Finally, I wanted to share the second quote from Margot Fontaine. We started with a quote of hers because it seems relevant for anyone, but especially artists and academics. 
making the work is incredibly rewarding and sharing it with others can be a tremendous joy. But it's also essential to be able to make fun of yourself and laugh at yourself. At least for me, humor, intuition, and play keep me focused and keep me and help me make the best work I can make. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions, right? Sonia, I was told you were going to moderate the questions. <laughs> That's what I was told. <laughs> if there are no questions, there, there are d'oeuvres next door. <laughs> Reflections on the title, the term "Why Pink Box" and "Why Decolonial." Oh, uh, because um, uh, paint box is just a, another way of saying a toolbox or a, a, a sort of set of resources. And because um, I feel like um, everything I've done, including projects that are not that I couldn't speak about, I mean, these are three pro the three main projects that I did while I was here. I should go back to the microphone. Um, you know, these are three, three principal projects that I did while I was here. There, I've done other projects as well while I've been here at Trinity. But they've all been informed by those childhood experiences and, and this, this, this deep, profound awareness of um, growing up in a colony. And so in some way or another, some more overtly, some less so, I feel like all the work is, is anti-colonial or decolonial. And I know there are differences, subtle differences between anti-colonial and decolonial. But could have been the anti-colonial paint box movie. That would have been more accurate. I don't know. Does that? <laughs> uh, Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I had the privilege of being able to look through uh, the internet earlier to see one of my friends I talked about. Oh, great. Um, I mean, that's a whole other comment. <laughs> 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 um, but I have two questions. The first, I was wondering, Talk a little bit about um, the differences that you're noticing using analog photography versus digital. Can you talk a little bit about what we use the digital sort of realm of photography? And then another thing that really struck me when I was looking at your photos is how, even though you're not present in the photo, you can kind of, one feels kind of your presence in the photo, they don't feel like sort of um, anthropological or like Distance or photos where you're spectacularizing your subject, and I could wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about how you build relationships with the, with the subject, the photographing with that kind of thing. Well, the first question is very easy to answer, and I could answer this, you know, but the, the second question is much more nuanced and it could go on a long time. Basically, to me, it's just a tool, and, and there was no digital photography before, so we all had to use film because that's what there was. I know people still use film and there are all these discussions about the look of film and this and that and people argue that they use film because it slows them down and it helps them be more thoughtful. I don't really think about that too much to me. Uh, you know, to, to me there, of course there's a cost associated with film every time you click the shutter, especially now that materials have gotten so expensive. You know, every time you push that button it's like 50 cents or a dollar. Just be, that's before you make any prints. You know. <laughs> so digital, uh, you know, people, I don't find, I don't find, I don't find that using film makes me more thoughtful. I, I enjoy the freedom of the digital, of digital. And so I have really no personal interest in going back to film. Uh, although I, I've also found that I can produce prints in black and white using digital that people can't tell the difference between the digital and, and film. So anyway, in terms of the other thing, um, uh, uh, maybe it has something to do with um, uh, my um, real love for um, <laughs> being there, right? Being there, um, being there and participating and, and sharing. And so I, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know, I guess the answers, the answers you would get from many photographers, but I feel like uh, spending a lot of time with folks, appreciating them, um, uh, having some kind of um, sense of who you get along with, who you like, who you click with, and those are the people you hang out with, and those are the people you want to get to know. If, if you, if you, um, 
if you uh, encounter someone and they may be famous or they may be doing some work, but you don't really feel a good connection with them, then maybe you walk away. Um, so uh, I, uh, I take a, a, a lot of pleasure of being with folks and getting to know them, and, and I cherish uh, who they are and try to celebrate that. And um, so I don't know, does that answer it a little bit? I'm <laughs> wondering if you could talk a little bit about your decision to go to China when Internet was being printed so that you could watch every page come off the press, um, which was not an inexpensive trip. And in fact, you might mention a little bit about the visa since you thought you were going to Hong Kong and ended up driving into mainland China. But talk a little bit about that kind of decision because I think it illustrates here that Pablo takes with every single minute of his work, which is partly the answer to your question. But I'll talk about that, Mila, but I also want to go back to the previous question because I, I would like to say that, you know, you and I, when we were working together, we both were in that vibe, right? We both enjoyed it. It was pleasure. It was a pleasure to share with people and to, and to share meals and to, and to talk and, just, and, and, and to wine and lime with people. Uh, uh, some people may not know those, those, what that means exactly, but that's okay. Uh, the, I, I think, Mila, you're making too much of this. Uh, photographers and artists uh, go, it's called going on press. It's what you do when you care about the book. You go to, it's being done less and less and less now because it's harder to travel, it's more expensive to travel. Uh, but it was routine for the designer or the photographer to go to where the book is being printed and approve the page proofs as they were coming off. Um, it's true that not that many will go as far as China, but often people will go to Italy or Germany. Uh, but um, but uh, it was an it was a odd arrangement. The the printer the printing broker was in Hong Kong, but the printing press was in China. So we had to drive from Hong Kong to Shenzhen, where I spent about ten days uh, in a conference room because you got to be there when these things come. The press is run twenty four seven. <laughs> you got to be. There to look at them and say, you know, darker, lighter, whatever. But yeah, I did go and hopefully it paid off. Yes, back there. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering uh, so, as a part of the Puerto Rican diaspora, a lot of what you showed was very resonated a lot with me, but also showed a lot of instances of trauma, especially within the video. Um, so I just wondered how do you go about dealing with instances of trauma so that? Um, your show isn't kind of only presenting the bad side, but also somewhat celebrating the culture in which you're studying. That's a, a great question. It's an important question. Um, and um, I think part of the answer has to do with people are not aware of, of so there are basically two audiences for the show, right? There's, there's us who grew up there and who know the experience, whether you're from the diaspora or you, whether you're from the island. Um, the, the installation speaks in a whole different level because you get jokes, you understand the historical stuff, you understand, but then there's North Americans who come in and see it and they're shocked. They're shocked in part because they don't know the history and they're shocked that their nation could have, could have so relentlessly depicted this place the way that they did. So it's kind of an outing, it's kind of a, it's kind of a look at the way, look at, look at the, to, to Americans, look at the way look at the way you all portrayed these people and to Puerto Ricans many of them haven't seen it so it's a wake-up call also it's like look at the way look at the way that um, we were portrayed by this country that do we you know because as you know right the, the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States is very complex and to break it to make it to simplify it a lot the, uh, um, uh, you could talk about status and the debate over whether uh, whether um, whether Puerto Rico should be a free independent country or a state of the United States like Hawaii or something in between, which is what it is now. And this is called, it's called Estado Libre Asociado, a free associated state or the Commonwealth, right? So uh, I'm hoping that people with this information that that, that they will be. Um, they will be sort of uh, equipped um, with information, will equip people with information that will inform 
their attitudes towards this, these discussions. Uh, and finally, I do think, I think it's empowering. And I think there's an element of the carnivalesque where you invert the stuff. It was made, it was made to be condescending. Well, not necessarily, I mean, it was meant to, <laughs> the funny thing is a lot of it was meant to be well-meaning, or it was, that was the intention, but then you see how clearly problematic it is, right? But taking ownership of it uh, is a way of, I think, dealing with that trauma. I mean, this is very, that's a very simple answer to a very, very long question. The, I mean, you could go on for a long time about this. But, yeah. I, I was precisely thinking about um, the way you were using, and you mentioned humor, and it's precisely what I was feeling in some of the uh, pictures and uh, elements that you presented. I was laughing, but a very powerful, bitter, bitter laugh. And, uh, and that's that, the liminal part of the humor of having old colony because we drank old colony as children and then this neo-colonial or colonial um it's the, so. it, absolutely i mean it is the, it, it's a colonial sense of humor that comes out of the need to survive it's a survival strategy you have to laugh yeah. Eric? Um, so you know uh, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I have two things. One is looking at, at your your photos from Trinidad um, and just equally engaging and exciting as part of the process is not just the photos, but hearing the dialogue, the, the rich dialogue between you and Mila during that production process. And that could be a book in itself. <laughs> But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how your perspective for photography may have been informed um, through just through your your life of having a family uh, connected with photography, and I, I'm just wondering how that you know just observing processes and you know I'm just wondering if you have any reflection on. on uh, Eric, I don't want to get into that too much but you deserve an answer so I'll, I'll put it no but I'll put it I'll put it one way which it might be kind of uh, so so the, the what the what occurs to me is 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 a word that it's a problematic word uh, but but uh, it can be interpreted in a problematic w way I don't mean it that way and I, I'll, I'll, I'll but it's it's a way that I can answer kind of succinctly which is that I had a privilege as a child I had a privilege not a monetary privilege, not a status kind of privilege, but I had a privilege to grow up in a home where both parents, my parents were artists and very engaged in, in art and in socially aware art. Uh, and as a child, I had the privilege of meeting all the, um, almost all the important and influential artists in Puerto Rico at that time because they were guests in my home. Um, and so uh, and of course, my you know my father was a photographer who was very much connected with the documentary tradition. And my mother was a graphic artist who introduced the silkscreen medium to Puerto Rico, and then silkscreen posters became something that Puerto Rico is known for. Right. So, in that sense, I had a privilege, and that of course informs what I do. You know. <laughs> uh, mostly with house paint, but <laughs> but uh, I but I I'm doing something that um, that I, I never really did much of before, which is sculpture. I mean, all these pieces are very much. I build all the display cases, all the all the shelves, uh, and the uh, the tableaus are very much very much composed. And although I use found objects. Um, the, their placement um, is very precise. I build all the little blocks that I put them on because I want them to be exactly the right height. So I may not be painting, but I'm certainly building and making uh, in ways that are not photography. Yeah. So we're going next yes, door. You're all